morning, New Beginning Church, and our online family and friends. Thank you once again for joining us on this beautiful Sunday morning. We give praise and honor to God for his glorious works on today. We're going to ask that you click that share button and share this video with your family and friends. I have a testimony, and I'm ready to tell it. For those of you who did not know, on November the 19th, I'm sorry, November the 11th, 2019, I was diagnosed as having breast cancer. And I remember going to the doctor on that day and she telling me the news and she was telling me and I was just looking at her, looking at her and I was thinking, you've got to be kidding. How can this happen? just finished my piano recital. The students had performed at one of the schools in, in, in um, the district. And I went to work that Monday, came home, was met with that. And the doctor told me that on Tuesday I never went back to work. And since then, it has been rough. I have been so sick. And in the very beginning, I couldn't even talk about it. God was dealing with me. But I knew that in order for me to get through this breast cancer, that I needed God and I needed the prayers of the saints. So after I could talk about it, the Lord released me to talk about it, I decided to tell everybody I knew. We told the church, we told the family members, I told neighbors, I told my coworkers, my students and my peers, I had everybody praying for me. Praying for me in the United States, in Nigeria, also in Mexico, people were praying for me. And I want you to know that I literally felt the prayers of the saints, and I thank you for that. Every morning I would get text messages from about four or five ladies giving me encouraging words just to help me make it through the day. And I thank them for that. I went through 16 rounds of chemo. I went through surgery. And while I was going through the surgery, I had to be dropped off at the hospital. My husband couldn't even come in. And I remember walking into the hospital telling God, God, I need you to help me. I need you to see me through this. And God did. He brought me through the surgery. Then I went through 30 rounds of radiation. In the midst of it all, God kept me. He kept my mind. Because I could have lost my mind. And every time when I went through surgery and while I was going through chemo, I had memorized Psalm 91. And I would say Psalm 91 every time I went to the doctor. And Psalm 91 starts out like this. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. And I trust him. You all, I had to really, really learn how to lean, depend, and trust God. There were times when I wondered if I was really going to make it. And the oncologist told my husband and I that he wanted us to try a trial drug. And after I read the, all the stuff in the trial drug, how it may cause heart attack and stroke and mess with your liver and your lungs and all that stuff. I looked at my husband and I told my husband, I'm not doing this trial drug. I'm not doing it. And I looked at him and I, with tears rolling down my face, I asked him, I said, baby, am I going to make it? And he looked at me and he told me, God, honey, we're going to trust God. 
we're going to trust God and trust his word. And so we did that. We never know what God is doing in our lives. And when God allowed trials and tribulations and sickness to come into our lives, we never know why he's doing that. But we just have to trust God and know that God is in the midst of whatever we're going through and that he's going to see us through. On this past week, I had a PET scan. And all while in the PET scan, I was just praying to God, God, please allow this PET scan to come back that I'm not, don't have any cancer in my body. And I'm like, God, I want to see my sisters and my brothers again. I want to see my nieces and nephews grow up. God, I want to see my mama see all the days of her life. And I was praying, I'm like, God, my husband needs me. We've been doing ministry. I want to continue to do ministry. I want to continue to teach music to children and tell them about Jesus. I went back to the doctor on Friday and the radiologist read the scan report and he said, your PET scan looks good. I said, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. God answered my prayer. I thank God for his healing powers. He kept me in the midst of my valley. He kept my mind. And he kept me looking good. Because some of you all didn't even know what I was going through. I thank and praise God for my husband, for his encouragement, for his prayers, for his steadfast faith in what he knew God could do. And when I text the NBC family my news on this week and results of the PET scan, there were a lot of encouraging remarks and thank you all so much because I know that all of you all have been praying for me. And guess what God has delivered? And Sister Diane Henry wrote these words. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 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 Jesus, 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 oh yes, Jesus, 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 he's my Savior, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's my healer, 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 yeah, Lord. Healer, 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 oh, healer, healer, healer. Healer, healer, healer. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 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 Father God, we thank you now. Lord, we bless your holy and righteous name. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for keeping us and blessing us, Lord. God, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to lift our voices, to raise our hands, to glorify you again, Lord. God, we thank you for your mercy. 
And we thank you for your mercy because we know that we're not deserving. We know, Father God, that if it had not been for your mercy, we would have been wiped out. But your mercy, Father God, kept justice away, kept judgment away, and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace this morning, Father. If it had not been for your tender loving kindness, yes, God. Lord, we wouldn't be here to raise our voices. Yes. We wouldn't be here another chance, Father God, to lift our hands unto you. Yes, now, Lord, we ask you to bless us. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. We ask you, Father God, to walk with us, Father God in such a way that men, women, boys, and girls will see us as living, walking epistles by which they will read, by which they will see, and by which they will honor you, Father God. Now, Lord, we thank you for the victory. We thank you for showing yourself up. We thank you, Father God, for showing yourself mighty. And, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to see your victory. Now, Father God, we realize if you had not done what we asked you to do, yeah. you would still be God, yes, yes, yes. you would still be good, yes, yes, yes. and you would still be on the throne. Now, Lord, we thank you for this preaching moment. Yes. For this moment, Father God, by which we can honor you. And Lord, we ask you to bless us now. Hold me behind Jesus that Jesus will teach and preach your word, that old habits will be rolled away, old burdens will be thrown away, that we will be better at 12 o'clock than we were at 10 o'clock, that lives will continue to roll on just a little while longer, that they will give you the honor, give you the glory, and give you the praise. Lord, we ask you to bless us, Father God, that we will always be careful to allow you to keep your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Jesus? What's his name? His name is Jesus. Jesus? Jesus? Master. Master, master, master. He's the master. Master, master, master. Jesus is. Master, master, master. His name is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's a healer. He's a healer. Healer, healer, healer. Yes, he is. Healer, healer, healer. He is a healer. He's the Savior. He's the Savior. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. He is the Savior. That's His name. That's His name, Jesus. 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 That's his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let me call your attention to Luke chapter 4 in the old in the New Testament. The book is Luke. The chapter is 4. Luke chapter 4. The book is St. Luke, Dr. Luke, the physician Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 is all we can get through today. Amen. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. When you found it, you will discover these words. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, 
being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when he had ended, he was, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I want to talk about the temptation of allegiance. The temptation of allegiance. You know, during these days, there's a lot of talk about where we pledge our allegiance. There are some that even have tried to make it an allegiance issue, a patriot, patriotic issue of whether one would pledge their allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. There are those in office, those at high levels, who would make you figure that if you do not pledge your allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, your patriotism does not exist. They seem to forget, they seem to forget men and women of color who have given their lives involuntarily for the sake of disruption, for the sake of discrimination, for the sake of non-patriotic failure in this world. Well, it's, it's, it's a problem, it's a problem, and, and I saw it as a problem even as a young man. As we stood in Head Start, and we turned toward the flag, and I remember those devout words. I pledge allegiance. I pledge my allegiance. I pledge the allegiance of my heart to the flag of the United States of America. When I looked up the word allegiance, it meant loyalty. It meant giving over my identity or my commitment. It meant to humble myself under one who is superior to us all. I said even as a little boy in, in Head Start that it's something wrong, and I cannot put my hands on it because all the adults are making us pledge our allegiance to the flag. So the adults must be right. They've lived longer. They, they know what they're doing. And certainly they have thoroughly investigated every word before they have the children at the age of two, three, four, and five, six, and seven stand and pledge their allegiance to this flag. I say to you today that I can only pledge my allegiance to one flag, and that is the blood-stained banner of Jesus the Christ. Words are words and words are vehicles by which thoughts are conveyed. And as we pledge our allegiance today, I stopped by on my way to the rapture to let you know you have to be careful to whom and to what you pledge your allegiance. When we look at the text, the situation is the same. But the situation can be more devastating in the text than it is in the United States of America. We find Jesus. We, we find this same message 
in Luke as it is in Mark and Matthew. We find the same lesson where Jesus himself is putting himself on the line so that he can paint a picture of how we ought to pledge our allegiance and whom we ought to pledge our allegiance to. We ought to tell our children, we ought to tell our children whenever it comes to giving our allegiance to something or somebody that opposes God, we can't pledge our allegiance to it. In the text, we find Jesus on trial. We find Jesus in the wilderness. We, we find Jesus hungry in the wilderness. In the text, we find two main characters there. The two main characters in the text is Jesus and Satan. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, Jesus and Satan are the two main characters in the text. And, and I learned in little, literary works at an early age that, that whenever there's a conflict, whenever there's a temptation, the temptation must be looked upon from three different angles. In literary works, it teaches you that whenever there's a conflict, there, these conflicts are made up of one or two or three of these areas. First of all, there's the conflict between man and nature. There's a conflict between man and nature. It's a conflict between man and nature because when it rains, it creates conflict for man. When the sun is too hot, it creates conflict for man. When men's lives get older, it creates conflict for man. So the first conflict we see in literary works is the fact that, that we have conflict between man and nature. And man very seldom can control nature. It takes God and God's authority to control nature. You know man can't control nature because you can hear the news reporter saying where well, the hurricane is going to hit by 10 o'clock tonight and way over in the middle of the night it's still at sea and then it hits in a totally different area hundreds and thousands of miles away. It says that there's a conflict going on between man and nature. The second conflict that they point out in literary works is a conflict between man and man. Yes, there's always a conflict. There's always temptation going on around every man, every woman, every child. There's always a conflict that we're going to have to face from day to day. Doesn't matter if you're single. Doesn't matter if you're saved. Doesn't matter if you're unsaved. Doesn't matter if you're married. Sooner or later, you're going to find yourselves in the midst of conflict. And your conflict is going to be between man and man. Yes. When I say man, I'm talking about uh, not, no, no particular gender. I'm talking about man and woman, woman and woman. I'm talking about boy and girl. There is always a conflict between man and man. In literary works, it says that there will be a conflict between man and nature, and there will be a conflict between man and man. In literary terms, there's a third conflict that takes place. And the third conflict that takes place in literary works is man against himself. Oh yeah, all of us can identify today. Sooner or later, we will find ourselves men against himself. Yes. It is an innermost war, an innermost being that's taking on a war on the inside. The Apostle Paul picks this thought up, being saved, being born again, does not clear you from trouble. Matter of fact, it starts a war on the inside. Yes. You see, before I came to Christ, I had trouble. Before I, before I got to know Jesus, I had trouble. But a war started boiling on the inside the moment I received, received Jesus as my personal Savior. The Apostle Paul says there's always man against himself in the fact that, that when he now is saved, he understands the direction that he needs to be headed in. He understands the fact that he has pledged his allegiance to God. But deep down within, there's a war going on in myself. Yes. 
I like Paul. Every time I would to do good, every time I try to do good, every time I think I'm going to do good, there's a war going on and something on the inside of me brings my members into this war of sin. I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been with the Lord and how long you've been walking with God. Sooner or later, you're going to have a conflict within you. Yes. And that conflict is going to be man against himself. It's when man's mind is not made up. The Bible says it like this. A double-minded man is unstable in every last one of his or her ways. Yeah, there's a conflict. Literary work says it like that. But the Bible says <laughs> that there's always a conflict. <laughs> and this conflict went on and started way back in the days of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. The first conflict that the Bible says that men would have the lusts within them. Men would be caught up in lust. There is what is known as lust of the flesh. It's a conflict within us. It's yes. the lust of the flesh. It's when we like to feed our flesh. It's lust of the flesh because in our flesh we love what we love and we're going to get what we love and we struggle with it and we wrap our minds around it we think we're going to do the right thing but there's a conflict called lust of the flesh Amen. the bible says there's a second conflict the bible declares that there's a second conflict and the second con conflict is lust of the eye it is when you like what you see and got to have what you see. It is, it is, it is the, 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 the German chocolate cake that I love so much. It is the carrot cake with no icing on the top. It, it is the nutty buddies that I pick up for snack. It is the conflict going on within me. It is lust of the flesh, lust of the eye. When I see it, I see it as Eve saw it. Eve saw it was, it was precious to the eye. When Eve saw it, she saw that it looked good to the eye. Some brother this morning has a problem with his eyes. He likes what he likes to see. He, he likes the shape that he sees. He, he runs after the shape that he sees. It's the lust of the eye. And you can't pledge your allegiance to what you see. In the Bible, there's a third conflict. The third conflict is the pride of life. Yes, it's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And whenever it's the pride of life, it is what will make us puffed up. It, it is what that will, will make us think that we're more than who we are. As a matter of fact, Lust in the pride of life will make us think that we are just as much God as God. That's the problem that Adam and Eve had. The serpent came to Eve and said, if you eat of this fruit, you won't certainly die. But what God knows, what God realizes is that you will become a God like he's God. Mm -hmm. So she ate. Adam ate. And when they ate, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eye became real not only to them, but came real, real to us. Now here we have Jesus in Luke chapter 4. This is after they had walked through the genealogy of Jesus mm -hmm. and telling you how he came from nothing in the flesh to royalty. Amen. But the reverse is as true. Jesus was already royal. Yes, he was already a part of the royal coat. He, he was already a part of the let us that God talks about in Genesis. Yes. Yeah, let me tell you, when God says let us, he's talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He was already royalty. Yes. He gave up his royal seat in heaven came down on Mother's Earth just to save a wrench like you and me. 
They had already walked through his genealogy in the text. They had already talked about who begot who and who he came from. And, and then uh, Matthew says in Matthew chapter 1, he says that he came down through 42 generations. And so this Jesus that we talk about, we ought to let the world know that he is our Savior. This Jesus that we talk about, he is the great master himself. This Jesus that we talk about, he's not only Lord, he's the Lord of Lords, not only the king, he's the king of kings. But in chapter 4, even Jesus was tempted. All the way from verses 1 to 4, it just gives us a snapshot of his temptations, of his allegiance. Look at the text. The text says in, 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 in Luke chapter 4, the text declares... Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, my dears, this Holy Spirit, pneumos in the Greek. This Holy Spirit that, that Jesus was filled with ought to be the Holy Spirit by which we are filled. Well, you know, it kind of got my attention here because I understand that the Holy Spirit himself is the third person of the triune God. He is the third person of the triune God. See, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who operate in equal authority. They are co-equal. They are co-eternal. They are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit himself. It was right after the baptism. The Bible says that Jesus went down into the water. Jesus went down into the water. And when he went down into the water, Jesus himself went down into the water. And when he went down into the water to be baptized, then the, the Bible says that Jesus came straightway out of the water. He came straightway out of the water. He came straightway out of the water. Matthew says he came straightway out of water. When he says he came straightway out of the water, we need to understand that Jesus was all the way in the water. You see, Jesus wasn't sprinkled at his baptism. Jesus, Jesus was not one that was spurted water upon. It was not sprinkled upon him. The Bible says that John was walking around. John the baptizer, John the Baptist was walking around, and he was bringing folk to Christ and baptizing them in the Jordan. The text even goes on to say that Jesus himself didn't baptize. But his disciples baptized. John the Baptist, known as John the Baptizer, saw Jesus coming and he said, there's one that's coming by which I'm not able to even lash his shoes. I'm not worthy of this Jesus because this Jesus is the one in which I pledge my allegiance. So here we are, this Jesus. That's our Savior, this Jesus who who's our Lord, this Jesus, who is our King, this Jesus, who we know as the one who is co-equal with God, he is God the Son himself. Even he was tempted. The text says in Luke chapter 4, the text says in Luke chapter 4, in Matthew chapters 3 and 4, the text declares that Jesus was led of the Spirit of God, led of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now Mark says it a lot differently. Mark says that, that when Jesus was led into the wilderness, Mark said that he was led by Satan himself to go into the wilderness. And he comes with this idea, Mark does, he comes with this idea that the devil drove him into the wilderness. The spirit of God led him, drove him. Satan dealt with him in the wilderness. Luke Chapter 4, it says that it was filled with the Spirit. It says to us today that we ought to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Let me just park right here and tell somebody that you don't have to get in another prayer line to be filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get another hand laid on you to be filled with the Spirit. Matter of fact, you didn't have to get the other hand laid on you to be filled with the Spirit. What you must do, what you have to do, what you got to do is be born again. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit of God. You must be born again. 
You must be born again. You must believe the story that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on a skull hill called Calvary over 2,000 years ago. You must believe that Jesus Christ died on a skull hill called Calvary. They laid him in a bottle tomb early that third day morning. He rose from the dead. If you ain't received this as your story, you believe this story, you invite Jesus Christ into your life based on this story, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It, 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 is, it, is, it is the feeling that comes with Jesus coming into your life. The Holy Spirit, he comes in. You see, the Holy Spirit is an intelligent being. He's the third person of the triune God. He's the third person of the Godhead himself. He comes in when Jesus comes in. God the Father comes in when Jesus comes in. Stay out of lines talking about being filled. You see, because... You have evidence by speaking in tongue doesn't mean you feel. The only thing that means that you feel is when Jesus comes into your life, the Holy Spirit fills you. You may run, you may shout, you may roll in the aisle, these things you may do that's left up to you and the Holy Spirit. But in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you need Jesus to come into your life. So Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, the text says in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it says that he returned from the Jordan. He returned from baptism. Let me tell you, your temptation would happen even after you've committed your allegiance to God. Your temptation will take place even when you're on the mountaintop. Your temptation will take place even when you're on a high in the Lord. In Matthew chapter 17, you find Jesus and three of his disciples on the mountain of transfiguration. He transfigures himself. He, he, his body shines. His clothes begin to shine like never before. He was radiant before them. And right there on the mountain, temptation showed up. Before they went back down the mountain, while they were on the mountain, temptation shows up. What are you talking about, preacher? Because when they were yet on the mountain, <laughs> Elijah showed up. Moses showed up, and old Peter spoke up. Peter said, Lord, let's just build three churches up here. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's don't go down there in the valley anymore. Let's just tabernacle up here a little while. Let me tell you, saints of God, you can't stay in church all day. You got to go outside the walls, and you got to tell somebody about the goodness of God. Amen. The second problem that took place on that mountain of transfiguration is the fact that they wanted to build a three churches, a three tabernacles on the mountain, and they wanted to make Moses and Elijah same as Jesus. Mm. Let me tell you, Jesus stands all by himself. There's no man that stands around Jesus. There's no man that stands up to Jesus. I told you before, if President Obama was to walk in the room, all of us would stand up in honor of a great man. But if Jesus walked in the room, we won't stand up. We would have to bow down because you honor great men, but you worship your God. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We worship God. We worship Jesus. We, we worship the Holy Spirit. We worship him because he alone is worthy. The text says he left Jordan. And after he left Jordan, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. What is your wilderness? What is the situation you're going through? What is your wilderness? What is, is it that you're going through? Sister David says her wilderness was cancer. <laughs> Somebody else listen to me. Your wilderness must be cancer. But if you're going through the wilderness, if your wilderness is HIV, if your wilderness is hunger, if your wilderness is whatever you have a problem with, you need to understand you need Jesus there with you. You need Jesus there with you. The Bible says he's led by the spirit of God into the wilderness and being tempted of the devil 40 days. Now, Luke says he was tempted of the devil 40 days. Matthew says that he was 40 days without food. And the Bible declares that when he didn't have food, the devil, when he had not eaten for 40 days, the devil tempted him. Let me just park right here and let you know, when you're at your weakest, that's when the devil will tempt you. When you've, when you've secured yourself all by yourself, when you've gotten away from people who lift you up and encourage you, then, then, then the devil will tempt you. 
Many people are tempted in the midnight hour. Many people are, people are tempted when they're going through some things because the devil doesn't care how weak you are. Matter of fact, he capitalized on your weakness. The moment you think you got it going on, the devil is going to capitalize on that. The moment when, when you think you're really a saint of God, then that is called lust, the pride of life through lust. And when you lust for the pride of life, you're on your way to failure because pride becomes before the fall. Let me tell you, the devil, the devil wants you to pledge your allegiance to him. So he tests Jesus. He tempts Jesus in the area of his allegiance. And all of us are being tempted day by day in the areas of our allegiance. Yeah. Where would you put your, your law support? Where would you put your law support? He says to Jesus, he says, after he had been tempted for 40 days by the devil. He had been tempted for 40 days by the devil. The devil, the rascal, the devil, Satan, the devil, the, the sneaky one, the devil, the subtle one, the devil is tempting Jesus. And the text says, tempted for 40 days by the devil. In those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when he had ended, he was hungry. Let me tell you, I don't know how spiritual you are, but <laughs> I get hungry. <laughs> and sometimes we ought to be fasting and praying and asking the Lord. And, and when the hunger pains get, get more powerfully beaten upon us, we ought to talk to the Lord. You see, hunger causes us to talk to the Lord. Yes. <laughs> Let me tell you, fasting it causes us to come near to the Lord. Fasting gets us to a point where we can understand God and God can understand us because we clear of our usual things. Is there anything you will sacrifice today to get closer to the Lord? Is there anything that you will go through and go beyond your, your normal reach to get to the Lord? Will you fast to get to the Lord? Will you, will you neglect your food to get to the Lord? Will you neglect your usual drink for God to speak to you? The Bible says Jesus was hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. And while he was hungry, look what verse 3 says. Luke chapter 4, verse 3 says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones, or command this stone to become bread. Look at him, look at him. The devil never tempts you in an area where you're not weak. You see, there are some things the devil can't tempt me with. There are some things that the devil can't get me on, but there are other things the devil knows I want. There are some things that the devil knows that I can't have, and he knows that I'm not going to reach for it, but there are other things that the devil been listening to me in my prayer when I ask God to do this for me. So the devil will sometimes give you a phony and a fake in order to make you think that it's real. He, he will give you things that will satisfy you for a moment. So here he is with Jesus. Jesus is hungry. And he tempted Jesus on his allegiance. He says, if you are the son of God. First of all, he deals with his identity. And secondly, he deals with his authority. Let me tell you, if God have given you an identity that is unlike your past, the devil will tempt you on your identity. He tempts us every day on our identity. You hear things like this. I remember when you wasn't like that. I remember when you weren't holy. I, I remember when you were doing your own thing and now you're walking with God. They want, they'll say like this, if you are a Christian, right. if you really love the Lord, then you understand that they're tempting you on your identity. Then he tempts Jesus on his authority. He tempts Jesus on who he is. He says, first of all, if you are the son of God, he questioned his identity. And secondly, he questioned his authority. 
The devil will always question your authority. He will always question who you are. He will always question the control you have. He questioned his authority. The son of God has great authority. He's the son of God because he's man and God. He, he talks about Jesus and he tempts Jesus in the area of his authority. He tempts him in the edge of his allegiance by asking him, if you really are the son of God, are you really the son of God? And if you're really the son of God, I know you're hungry. So turn this stone into bread. Yes. Yes. I said to you that he tempts you in areas of your allegiance. He tempts you in the areas where you hurt the most. He, he tempts you in the areas where, where, where life is dependent. He will tempt you on your identity. He will tempt you on your authority. He will tempt you on your very being. The devil will always try you and where your allegiance lies. This word allegiance means to bring yourself under subjection of one in power. This word allegiance means to bring yourself under subjection. It means to be loyal to those who are in power. It means to be committed to those who are in power. So the devil tempts him here on his allegiance, his commitment, <clears throat> and his loyalty. And he does it at a time when he's hungry. There are some people here with me today that if they get hungry, you can buy them for a nickel. It's kind of like the Jacob Esau situation where Jacob was able to buy a birthright because he gave him a, a, a pizza, a, a, a little round bowl of soup, a little round bowl of food. Where's your allegiance? We're in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm, be I'm beginning to wonder, the leaders of this nation, where are their allegiance? Is their allegiance lying to a party or to the people? Does their allegiance lie to a, a Republican Party or a Democratic Party while over 150, nearly 160,000 people have already died? Do they rather pledge their allegiance to a party, to a to a Republican Party or a Democratic Party while human beings keep on dying? Where is their allegiance? Now, when we went to vote for them, their allegiance was to us. Yes. I mean, everybody made their own promises. Even the president made his promise that, that he was going to he was going to have the allegiance to the people until he was going to drain the swamp. And he has made it a cesspool pool instead of draining the swamp. In the midst of Jesus being hungry. In the midst of Jesus not eating for 40 days. You see man can live without food for 40 days. He can live without food. I'm telling you, you can live without food for 40 days. Jesus lived without food for 40 days, and the devil knew he was hungry, so he confronts him on what he's having a problem with. In the physical body, we get hungry. Jesus got hungry in his physical body. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Matthew says, command these stones to become bread. So he says, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus began to quote Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 3. He quotes it and makes it clear to the devil, it is written. Mm -hmm. My dears, you have to get to a point where you know the word, where you can tell the devil what is written. In the midst of your temptation, in the midst of the devil tempting you, in the midst of the devil calling you out on your authority, calling you out on your loyalty, calling you out on your allegiance, calling you out on your identity, you need to understand that the devil has no place in your life and the devil will always tempt you in those areas. So today he tempts Jesus in one of those areas. And this area is the pride of life. He tempts Jesus in the area of pride of life. 
How proud are you? How proud are you that you will not allow God to be your king? Allow God to be your leader. Allow God to be the one you subdue yourself to in the midst of your pride. Pride comes before the fall. Today I'm telling you in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, the devil tempts Jesus, and Jesus says, it is written. We have a major problem here today in this great faith we walk in. Our problem is people don't know what is written. <laughs> we don't know what is written. We haven't picked the book up. We, we like to shout. We like to rejoice. We like to raise our hands. We like to do our dance. But at the end of the day, you need to know what is written in God's word. Amen. Jesus quoted what is written. Will you, will you quote what is written? When the Jehovah's Witnesses come by, will you tell them what's written? You see, the problem with the Jehovah's Witnesses is that they come to your door. The problem with us, not with them. The problem is they come to our door as Christians, use our Bibles, and whip us with our Bibles because we don't know what is written. And I'm not talking about walking around knowing the whole Bible. I'm not talking about reading the Bible all day long in order to know what is written. I'm talking about putting the word of God in your heart. And as you put the word of God in your heart, God is able to bless you that it will come out of your heart and out of your mouth at a given time. Whenever there's conflict, whenever, whenever there's problems, whenever there is trouble, God knows how to bring the word up out of you and out of your mouth. We need to speak the word. We don't need to cuss them out. We don't need to force it out of them. We don't need to fuss it out. We don't need to bless them out. We need to speak the word. And as we speak the word, the devil's temptation has to cease. Jesus says, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. But Jesus answered him and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out the mouth of God. We need to know the words that come from God. We need to know that this is the God when the earth was void, when the earth was null, when the earth was had, had no real existence, when there was chaos among the deep, this God that we're talking about, that's the one I pledge my allegiance to. The God that spoke out on nowhere in the midst of nothing on an island called nothing in the darkness was upon the deep. That God spoke and light came floating down through the universe. That's the God where I put my allegiance and not only he is the God where I put my allegiance because he's the creator, he's also my feeder. Yes. He is the one that feeds me when I'm hungry. He feeds me. He feeds me his word. And, and as he feeds me his word, I need to pray the word and pray over the word. I need to speak the word. And when I speak the word, I want to make sure I'm saying what God has said. Yes. Because when the preacher is not saying what God has said, the preacher is a false prophet. The preacher tells a lie on God. So we all, and you don't need to be a preacher. We all need to make sure that we speak the word of God as God has spoken the word. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher. You just need to be Christian. And every Christian needs to know the word of God. We ought to be in school learning the word. We ought to walk around daily quoting the word. We ought to walk and have our quiet time sometime and reading and studying the word. We ought to do like the old cow used to do in the backwoods of Mississippi. He had an inner stomach and an outer belly. And what he would do is chew on the cook, the same cook, all day long. He would drop it down in his inner stomach and he would regurgitate it and bring it back up. He would drop it down in his outer belly. He would eat it and drop it down in his outer belly, regurgitate it, bring it back up and chew on it some more. That's how we ought to do the word of God. We ought to chew on the word of God in such a way that we can bring it up when God wants to use us. We ought to know the word. Learn the word. Spend time in the word because the devil is going to tempt you. He's going to tempt you in several areas. He's going to question your identity. He's going to question your authority. 
He's going to question where you, your, lies, your loyalty lies. He's going to question where your com commission and your commitment is. He's going to question whether you're under subjection of a superior officer. My superior officer is Jesus. Mm -hmm. The reason why Jesus is because I was on my way to hell. And over 2,000 years ago, he died on a skull hill called Calvary. He is my superior officer. He is my commander in chief. He's my officer in charge simply because over 2,000 years ago, on a skull hill called Calvary, he gave up the ghost. Many men killed him as he hung from the cross. After he died, they pierced him in his side. Out came blood and water, water for my purification and blood for my deliverance and my atonement. While he was laying there, hanging there between two thieves, the earth began to rear and rock like a drunken man. The S-U-N refused to shine. The earth took an epileptic fit and began to reel and rock and it became dark in the middle of the day. It became midnight at midday because the son of God was dying that day. They took him off the cross. Yeah, yeah, they took him off the cross and they laid him in a barber tomb because early that third day morning, he gave Joseph his brand new tomb back again. You are here today and you never confess Christ as your savior. This is your moment. Yes. This is your opportunity. You need to get to know Jesus for who he is. The son of God. The one with authority. Yes. The one with the right identity. The one who has loyalty to us and we ought to have loyalty to him. We ought to be committed to him. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, this is your moment. You, get, you need to get to know Jesus. He is waiting for you. He is the one who make a difference in all our lives. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Come to Jesus as you are. You don't have to be changed to come to him. He does the changing for you. Won't you get to know him today? If you never received Jesus, as your personal savior. You can get to know him today. Get to know Jesus today. Get to know him right now. He's waiting for you. He is asking you to come. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. I know you've been trying to get it right but you'll never get it right. You need Jesus to get it right for you. You can receive him today by simply believing the story that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose from the dead. Romans chapter 10 verse nine says, if you believe this story, that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose. You can be saved right here, right now, today. John 3.16 says God loves us. And he loved us to the point that he had his son Jesus lifted up as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the serpent in the wilderness. When they were bitten by snakes, Moses would lift up the serpent in the wilderness. And when he lift up the serpent in the wilderness, the people that looked upon him, they were healed of their snake bites. I want to tell you today, we've been snake bitten. Sin is running rapid. We've been snake bitten. But just as Moses held up the snake in the wilderness, the son of man, Jesus, has been lifted up on planet earth. You, get to know, you need to get to know him today. You, get, you need to get to know the son of God. The one with the right authority. The one we ought to commit ourselves to. If you can trust him today, 
by believing the story, you can qualify for heaven when you die. Please just repeat after me in this little simple prayer and invite Jesus into your life to be your Savior and your Lord. Please join me in prayer. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer and honestly invited Christ into your life, we believe that you are born again, you are saved. You're on your way to heaven when you die. Please inbox me and let me know that you invited Jesus into your life so we can rejoice together, so we can walk together, so we can celebrate together. Thank you for joining us. And if there's somebody here that needs prayer, Inbox me and let me know so I can pray with you and pray for you. If you are listening to me today and you're in between church homes, whether near or far, I introduce you to the New Beginning Church. You can be a part of our church. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. We will welcome you. We, we want you to be a part of the New Beginning Church. A church where Jesus is the captain of the ship. Where Jesus have all authority. Where Jesus Christ is the one who makes the difference. I welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Inbox me and let me know that you need prayer. Inbox me and let me know you want to join the New Beginning Church. And inbox me and let me know that you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. It is time. You can give to the Lord at the New Beginning Church in three forms. You can give by way of Cash App. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. You can give by way of Cash App. You can give by way of Zelle, and you can do that by placing in our email, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. You can give by way of Zelle, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The third way you can give is mail your checks in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Mail your checks to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us for our worship service today at 1045 a.m. as we are here every Sunday morning at 10.45 a.m. Please continue to join us. Thank you who have been joining us at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. 9 a.m. for Sunday school every Sunday morning. And then join us on Wednesday night. Wednesday nights, every Wednesday night at 7.20 p.m. for Bible study. We look forward to sharing the Word of God with you even on Wednesday night as we do on Sunday morning in Bible study at 20 p.m. every Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us. My dears, this, this Tuesday, we're looking forward to our prayer time together at 7 p.m. This Tuesday, we're looking forward to our conference call prayer time where we get together and call on the Lord for the ills of this world, the ills of our family, and the ills of ourselves. Uh, join us in prayer. Uh, join us on the prayer line. It's this is the second Tuesday, second Tuesday, we give attention to the prayer line where we come and pray before the Lord. Join us at uh, 
7 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday evening, second Tuesday of every month. And then we have our Zoom prayer meeting on fourth Tuesday every month. We have a Zoom prayer meeting on fourth Tuesday every month. Just want to remind you to be there with us this coming Tuesday at, uh, at 7 p.m. for our, our conference call prayer time. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sister Davis, for your testimony. Why don't we thank the Lord for a powerful, a powerful testimony in the Lord that God has blessed us and has wrought his righteousness upon us in his power and his authority, showing that he's a healer and he is a healer of all things and all people. We thank God for this privilege. Now let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus is a healer. Thank you, Lord, that he has authority. He has an identity that gives us our identity. We thank you, Father God, for our loyalty and our allegiance to Jesus Christ, our commitment to the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is leading us as he already dwells in us. Bless us now, Father God, as we leave this place. Never leave our presence, Father God. Bless us, Father God, that we will take you where we go. And we ask you to go before us and be our real God behind us. Lord, we ask you to bless those who are plagued from this awful virus called COVID-19. Bless every family member. Bless every bereaved person. Bless our church members, our visitors, our friends, and our family members. Lord, we ask you, Father God, that times like these, we will understand that God is in control. He has all authority, and he's still sitting on the throne. Lord, we pray that you bless our leaders and our government system. Bless, Father God, that you will turn their hearts in a direction toward you, that the people will no longer suffer. The Lord, we know, Father God, when those who are righteous are in power, the people rejoice. And Lord, we ask you to intervene now. Shut the virus down. Shut Satan down in the government. That we will have power and authority. That we can tell the devil it is written. And we will, will, will not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We thank you now, Father God. Keep us in our temptations that we will not allow temptation to yield unto sin. Bless us that we don't yield that our temptation will become sin. And Lord, we trust you. We bless you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.